when you look at Siegfried and, and the, these other sort of earlier visions of, of what would be a, you know, a newer and, and greater being, I, I really feel these are, they're very heavily anthropomorphized, as are Wagner's gods and, and the Greek gods and so forth. And when you look forward at the kinds of AI we're going to be cre creating in the next decades, I think it, it, it's important to see how broad the scope of possible AI minds is, is going to be. So we're, we're really at a unique position in, in human history now, one that I think Nietzsche vaguely foresaw and Wagner did not foresee from what I know of. We're at, we're at a point where we're really on the verge of being able to create minds and, and beings that go very far beyond humanity, as, as far, let's say, as we are beyond chimpanzees or cockroaches or even one-celled organisms. And that, 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 that's, that's an amazing thing that's unique in the history of life on Earth or humanity, right? So it's not, of course, it's not going to begin that way. What we have now, we have what I call narrow AI systems. We have AIs that can carry out highly specific tasks and do these things better than, better than uh, humans can. So they can play Go better. Before long, they'll be driving a car better than, than any human. They can already predict stock market better, analyze DNA better than, than people can. But they don't understand the broader context in, w in which they're, they're operating. So they're used as tools by, by people rather than being autonomous, intelligent agents. Right? And the next step, which I described in, in my book that you mentioned, the AGI revolution, the artificial general intelligence revolution, the next step is going to be AIs that are able to generalize far beyond their domain of experience, which requires not just solving well-defined technical problems, it requires imagination and, and creativity and the ability to take a bold leap into the unknown. Once we have these AGI systems, then of course this will have some minor social impact, like eliminating the need for, for all human jobs. but. Uh, Additionally, these AIs will be able to do AI, right? They'll be able to design new hardware. They'll be able to write new software. They'll be able to improve their own minds. So once you have an AI which is at the level of general intelligence of, say, the people in this room, that AI will then be able to replicate itself a million times because you can do that with software. It will be able to improve its own hardware, introspect into its own mind and software, and improve itself, but then once it's made itself a little smarter, it will be even smarter at making itself smart. And then you will repeat, and th this, this is how you will get a mind that is, is tremendously superhuman. Not, not a superman, as Nietzsche called it, but a supermind, a, a super being. And you have to imagine at a certain point, this sort of AI will leave humanity as such far behind, just as we've left fish and, and, and one-celled organisms far behind. But the scope of possibilities is, is really quite broad. And people tend to anthropomorphize tremendously and think that, you know, AI minds going beyond humanity, they're either going to be our slaves or they're going to want to imprison us or oppress us. We tend to envision these AIs as somehow entering into human drama and, and human emotion and human society, whereas actually you know, if, if you think about how we relate to ants or squirrels, we have, no, we have no desire to mess with their love lives or argue with them over a leaf or an acorn or something, right? We're, we're, just, we're just occupied with, with, different, with different things. So having said that, that I think ultimately through recursive self-improvement, AIs are going to become tremendously more intelligent and capable than human beings in ways that no human will be able to understand without following the AI and giving up their humanity. They're also... Can I, can I ask you a question? Certainly. Why in the world do you find this attractive? <laughs> it sounds completely horrifying to me. That is to say, if they will not be perfected human beings, which you're saying they won't be, they will be an entirely new class yeah. of being, then we're talking about uh, something that... Um, will affect the human world in a way that will make it unrecognizable to us. Extinct. Well, well do, do you think that humans are undesirable because they're not simply upgraded and improved rats? No, no, I don't, no, 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 I, you know, there is... But a rat might. Well, a rat might, but you know, there is, I, you reminded me, there's a passage 
that I love in an early 17th century Jewish philosopher who lived in Prague. And what the philosopher says is, he says, he begins by saying that the human being is, and it's the standard medieval definition, he says, the human being is the creature who aspires to perfection, that that is the definition of the human. But then he turns the screw in one more time, and he says, and in such a creature whose definition is the aspiration to perfection, perfection itself would have to be accounted a flaw and a shortcoming, because that is not what we are. That is not what we are. I mean, you know, the limitations that you or others want to transcend and go beyond are actually the conditions of our definition. In other words, there are people who want to become, who, who fantasize about immortality. But if you study human life, you realize that the relationship between human meaning and temporality and time is so great that if you erase, if you sever that connection, you may get some new kind of creature, but it's not clear that that, that, that redemption will be meaningful to the creature who's redeemed. I, I don't understand, you see, I don't, I mean, it all sounds, the fact that we can do it doesn't mean that we should. I mean, this is the case with, I mean. Well, there, there, there's, there's a number of issues here. So w one is whether this advent of super intelligences is likely to happen. The other is whether it's desirable in some general sense. The other is why I personally think it's a good thing. And the, the, first, the first one of these is easiest. I think it's going to happen because advanced AI te technology has so much economic and humanitarian value. Each step along the way, the AIs that people build are making money for people and they're delivering good by, by curing, curing diseases, by eliminating human drudgery. So we're, it's not like nuclear weapons that blow people up and don't have much use otherwise. I mean, but, but AI, you, AI is being developed said, globally then, because, it, because it's useful. But what you said is that you want to, that ultimately it would eliminate humanity, I human say, beings. I You're talking not, about no, another form. I did not say it will eliminate human beings by, by, by any means. And humans have not eliminated ants, squirrels, or bacteria either. They still exist. And each of these Thank forms you. of life and intelligence has its own beauty and, and integrity. And the fact that humans are more generally intelligent than rats or bacteria doesn't mean they don't have their own in, intrinsic, aesthetic, or, or, or moral value. In your book, you also write, um, getting old and dying is with capital letters a very bad thing. Uh, be better frozen than rotten. I love that sentence. Um, you also write uh, um, what, I, what I expect from new technology is world peace, immortality for those who want it, everybody liberated from needing to work for a living. I want to radically transform humanity for the better. But again, that's, 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 that's Leon's... Uh, well, this, this gets back to one of Wagner's psychological defects that, that Nietzsche pointed out, which is the exaltation of, of death as something so amazing and, and beautiful. And of course, we can find beauty in everything. I mean, you, mm -hmm. can, you can find beauty in torture or in a disfigured corpse if you're, if you're a great artist. On, on, on the other hand, I think on balance, we'd be better off if we didn't have to, have to get old and die. And the fact that people have found a way... But why is that? Why do you think that? I mean, putting the pain aside, it would be much better if we could sicken and die without pain. But why do you think that immortality is attractive? In fact, there's an opera, you because know it, of the, Ma good. the Macropolis case, mm. remember, in which, in which it, it's a mystery story, and the solution to the mystery is that the heroine of the opera in the 1600s drank a potion that gave her immortal life, right. and she can't stand it <laughs> anymore. <laughs> She just can't stand it anymore. Proving things about reality by recourse to fiction is usually a, a poor idea. Well, hold on, hold on. What uh -huh. you just described, what you just described, the, the, the entities and beings that you just described are at least as fictional as. as Elena Macropolis. I mean, that's a, you know, you're imagining something. No, 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 no.